Okay, I'm gonna go to the first song because that's how I did that that one time, you know. Well, that's I, where we're gonna go. We're gonna start at the first. Yeah, but song. I left my book and then I just came back and played, <laughs> oh, and well. then we had to stop so I could get on the right song. <laughs> you kind of it very discreetly. John, John, John just came over and whispered to you, and then you said, "Okay, everybody, stop." And then you just calmly turned around and said, "Blah blah blah." It was about as cool as you can make it, you know. <laughs> I've had so often where I screw it up. I think I'm used to just covering it up these days. <laughs> Good morning, St. Luke. Super Bowls today. The Vikings aren't in it. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> we welcome you here today, and we believe here at St. Luke that you are not here by accident, but that the Lord has led you here. We ask now that you stand and uh, greet the people close to you. You can give them the fist pump or elbow shot or whatever. <laughs> All right, slick. Yep. And you can please remain standing and uh, join us in this first song, Your Grace is Enough. Your grace is enough for me. 
Please be seated. Relax. Uh, I'm Pastor Craig. I'm uh, the bridge pastor here. Uh, and this is my last Sunday. It's been a pleasure to be with you. So if you just first time to see me, I'll, bye. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here. I want to thank, be, be so welcomed by so many people and the staff here and uh, lovely music. Uh, I'm impressed with the, the band on Wednesday, the band on Sunday. They have uh, interchangeable parts. And it's really, you're really blessed with musicians here. That's really great too. So. God bless you as you start a new chapter in your history as your new pastor, Pastor Keith, comes. Uh, I believe he's starting tomorrow. So, uh, Support the youth trip to Texas. You can talk to Alex about that. I'm sure he would be, he takes checks and cash and all sorts of things. The annual meeting is next Sunday at this time slot, so there won't be a 10.30 service, but we hope you'll come to the, the meeting. There is a pre-meeting report out in the entrance to the church if you'd like to take that home and study that before next week. Um, support friends in need by bringing bath tissue, facial tissue, and paper towels. That's what they need. Bath tissue, facial tissue, uh, paper towels. Uh, tomorrow at Chipotle in Cottage Grove, you, if you go there and eat, um, half of what you spend will come back to St. Luke's for its ministry here. So um, go Mexican tomorrow at Chipotle. As I told the early service, uh, we have no Chipotle in Chisago City, but you can get Ludafisk every day of the year. <laughs> And soup suppers begin on the 21st. Ash Wednesday is the 14th when we start services at 7. But then the next Wednesday night, soup suppers will start at 6 with worship to follow. I believe those are the announcements.
I invite the children to come forward. Please come forward and we'll do some talk. Oh, I'll do some talk. Yeah, good to see you. I don't know if you saw, some of these children are our liturgical dancers over here. And very nice, I'm just jealous. I wish I could move like that. Um, I don't know if you have this at home. Uh, I didn't have it when I was a kid. Uh, but uh, they have a thing in some homes called a timeout chair. Do you have that in your place? No. No? Oh, well. <laughs> well, that's wonderful, I guess. You do? Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, we had a timeout room. That's where mom sent us when we needed a timeout. But, but it's a timeout chair some people have. And you know, when, when, when we need a timeout at home, a break, a start over, there's a chair that maybe we might go sit in. Um, it's not punishment. I think kids see it as punishment, but it's not. It's a way to just slow things down and get started again. Um, it's kind of like in sports. Is a timeout in a basketball game punishment? No, it's a time for them to focus, refocus and rest a little bit. Uh, time to, for someone to try to sell you beer, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, so it's just a time out. Well, Jesus took a time out too. Do you know that? We're going to hear in the story that Joe's going to read that Jesus, he was busy helping people and helping people and he got tired and he just had enough and he had to go off and I would call it his time out chair. He had to go take a break. He had to get recharged, refocused. And so even Jesus did that. And it's, it's a really good thing. Yeah, because time outs are a way for us to take a break in life. You know, sometimes at home, maybe, maybe you're sad or maybe you're angry or maybe you're excited or maybe you just are bouncing off the walls and maybe your mom or dad says, okay, we need to take a break. Why don't you go sit down here for a while and then we'll get started again. It's a wonderful thing. And your parents need that too. They need a break from each other. They need a break from what's been happening. You know, where I live, uh, uh, mo mothers send daddies out to the fish house. That's their time out. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a common thing all over the place. And Jesus shows us how valuable it is today. Thanks for coming up. Appreciate it. You can go back to whatever you were doing before. Yeah.
Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. Jesus heals many. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Jesus prays in a solitary place. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place, place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is where, why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. There ends the reading. Sorry, Sarah, for calling you Joe just a little bit ago. (laughs) 
Several years ago, there was a story uh, about a disaster at sea. Um, I believe it took place in Southeast Asia, where they, uh, there, there and other places, they have these huge ferry boats. Uh, maybe you've seen them on the news, or maybe you've ridden in one, uh, where they take uh, many, many cars underneath, and then uh, hundreds and hundreds of passengers. And they take them to islands or to other cities uh, in a close proximity, proximity for a vacation or visit relatives or whatever. Well, this particular day, after everything is loaded and they start out into the bay at night, um, something happened that the, the huge doors in front, you know, these huge doors that go down and that allows the cars to come in, that door didn't get sealed. It, I don't know whether it was a malfunction or an error, human error. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's hard to know who to blame. But water starts pouring into this ship at night. And you can imagine the passengers as this huge craft starts to list how they're panicking. Where do they go? Are they going to survive? You know, just probably screaming. And in all of this madness, this man appears and he starts giving orders. Tells the crew to get over at the, man the lifeboats and help people in. Then he helps direct people in kind of an orderly way as they're panicking, trying to calm them down, get to the lifeboats. And then when most of the people on the upper deck are to the lifeboats, he goes down into the hold where it is dark and water is starting to come in and people are very afraid, I'm sure I would be. And he, and he helps people form a human chain, a human ladder, to go up the stairs to the deck and to get out. It is said that he saved many people on that night. And yet the next morning they found that he had drowned, this man. They didn't even know who he was. He wasn't a member of the crew, wasn't the captain. But he was someone who had authority in that moment to change things dramatically. If you want to think about what Mark is doing in his gospel, that's a good image to have in your mind. He sees Jesus like this stranger coming on the scene in Galilee where the world is beset by all sorts of things that make you panic, make you afraid, make your life dysfunctional, unhappy, terrible. And you almost, with Mark, you almost have to catch your breath because there's one thing after the other. We haven't even got out of the first chapter yet. We'll still be there next week when he deals with the leper. He's got all these things that are panicking, hurting people. Today, it's his new disciple, Simon Peter's mother-in-law. They go to her home and she has a fever. And she is laying down. Now, we don't hear that in the same way that they heard that back then, like so many things we read in the Bible, we hear this story with modern ears. And when we hear fever, we say, well, that's not good, but we give them uh, some Tylenol, uh, you know, and watch them, keep fluids. Uh, if they get worse, take them to the hospital. You know, it's not a terribly big deal, although sometimes it can be serious. But in the first century, in Palestine, and everywhere else in the world probably, this was close to a death sentence. Typically, people did not recover from fevers. There was nothing to do. They either got well or they didn't. There's not even in Palestine any ice to pack them in to lower the fever. So you see, this is another scary time in people's lives, and Jesus comes there. And he takes her by the hand and raises her up. Once again, Jesus crossing boundaries. He has authority to do this, evidently, somehow. No one gave him that authority that they knew of. It isn't what they typically see. Why, where does he get this? The audacity to do this. Where does he get the power to do this? They wonder. And he even crosses well-established lines. He takes her hand. 
Well, you probably know in the first century, men were not allowed to touch women and vice versa unless they were connected to them very closely, very intimately by marriage. So he's crossing another boundary. He seems to have the authority to do that. And she, she becomes well. It doesn't say how long it took, but you could infer that it didn't take very long and she suddenly, the fever broke and she's better. And what does she do? She goes to the kitchen and starts feeding people. Now you women here probably think, oh my gosh, what kind of society is this? This woman doesn't even have a chance to get better. She doesn't even have a chance to rest. She's back in the kitchen right away. Maybe you women have felt like that sometimes. You have these, all these expectations on you. But you see, once again, we're hearing them in our modern time, not with the ears of people back then. What Jesus does doesn't, isn't simply to heal her, but he restores her to her important function in that society, which was hospitality. There are these people visiting. They need to be fed. They need to be cared for. And that, whether you like it or not, was an important function of a woman 2,000 years ago. Now today, if Mark was writing the story, he'd say, well, she probably got right up and she went back to the boardroom to run her corporation. Or she went to the hospital to doctor or to nurse. She went back to school to teach her students. She went back to uh, taking care of her children. You know, we'd be, we'd, there were a multitude of ways in which a restored woman in our day would be back to serving. And that's Mark's point. And people are just amazed, just amazed. And so they come to the house. You can imagine, you know. It's kind of like the Super Bowl. People come from all over. I'm wondering why, after watching all these people shiver out in the cold, but um, that was what it was like. And then Mark says an interesting thing. Jesus was kind of overwhelmed by it. You know, we think of Jesus as indestructible and we think of Jesus as, you know, he can do anything. He's like Superman, like Batman. Not according to Mark. He feels pain. He gets tired. He gets angry. He dies. All these things. He is overwhelmed by all these people pressing him. So he typically, what he does, he goes off to a quiet place. So they told the kids, like kind of like a time out. You need a place to pray, to be alone, to recharge the batteries, to fill the cup, all those metaphors we use. Well, you understand that, don't you? You probably find times in your life just like Jesus. You don't want to be around people. You want a quiet place. In one of my uh, earlier parishes, a, a child psychologist in my parish, she, after her day when she was seeing uh, children all the time with a vault, multitude of issues and parents too. Uh, she'd come home, her husband said she'd come home, uh, she would get a glass of wine out of the refrigerator and she would go to the bedroom and shut the door and she'd turn on some classical music and she'd sip her wine and no one could talk to her for an hour. You know, she just needed that time to recharge. That's what Jesus is doing. And you know, if in order for good to have good self-care, you have to do that too. So that not not just because you need a break, but so you may be more effective again as a parent or as a teacher or whatever you do. That time apart is essential. Huh. But of course, you know you also know this that after you try to get that time apart, there's somebody looking for you your family, friends, whatever. You call back and, and sure enough, his disciples come looking for him. Where you been? We've got tons of people at the house. Your, Peter's mother-in-law is going nuts. She's coming to cook for all these people. I, now, if you read the Bible carefully, it doesn't say that. I was putting words there, but that was the, that was the issue, the urgency. We got to go back and and tell you, we're, we've been so successful. This is going so well. Better than we ever thought. So come on back. And then Jesus does a surprising thing. He says, no. 
We're not going back. We're going forward. There's lots of other places we have to go. We can't stay here in Capernaum. I know it's your ancestral home. I know it's where you know a lot of people, where it's all familiar, where your, your families live, where your home is. I know that, but we must keep moving forward. There are other towns, there are other communities that need to hear the good news of the kingdom and experience it. Now this is a good word, I think, today for you as a congregation. For you are on the cusp of a new chapter. Your pastor's coming tomorrow, as I've been told. Pastor Keith. And all this preparation for him to come, uh, several months of interim, was working up to this moment. So that you could look at the history of your congregation. What has been going well, what hasn't been going so well. How do we have to adapt and look to the future? But you see, we're all like, like those darn disciples, right? We like what's familiar. We like what's been the same. It's, change is scary. You know how that goes in our, in our culture. How have things been changing? Thomas Friedman says, if you graph it, it's like a hockey stick. Change. It's kind of flat for a short period of time, and then it takes off. And he said, that's the problem in our day for us to deal with, is all the change. It's changing in work, it's changing in the family, it's changing in society. And religion tends to, and sometimes this is good, to say, wait a minute, let's go back. But Jesus says, you have to go forward. Think about how much has changed in this community in 30 or 40 years in our world in 30 or 40 years. There's always that desire in us to go back. Why can't the church be like it was when I was 10? You know? I kind of liked it then. I have fond memories of it. But you see, God, I think, in Jesus here is calling us forward to work with the staff here and the new pastor and for them to work with you in forging a vision Moving on, you just can't stay in Capernaum. And this is good news because God goes with us. God doesn't sit back there and say, Oh, come on back here, where you were. God doesn't, doesn't work that way in the Bible, never has. God is always like the God of the Exodus, moving his people forward. And may God bless you in that. Amen. Let us all pray. Gracious God, I hate change. I hate computers. I hate technology. Although I see their benefits, I just don't want to catch up. Isn't that like our life? Help us. For you lead us forward into a new day and bid us not to be afraid because the one who has authority over darkness and illness and hurt goes with us. Bless all in our country who are leading us that they may have a vision of the future, that they may lead with humility and wisdom. We pray for all those who suffer this day, the sick, the wounded, the grieving, the brokenhearted, hungry, exploited, those with malaria and all who need our prayers, especially Sharon, Skyler, Susie, Jim, Rod, Emily, Carol, Cadence, Audrey, Bev, Daniel, Dave, Heather, Dan, Bill and Bernice, Cheryl, Dale, Bob, Pat, Doris, Pam, Linda, Marshall, Pastor Sue, Russ, May, Johanna, Joe, Mina, Lori, Vi, Jason, Chris, K, 
Kelly, Lori, Mark, in whatever their circumstance, we pray that your voice may be heard in their lives. We pray for those poor Floridians and Californians who are here today for the Super Bowl and wonder what's going on. Give them a positive experience. We pray for everyone's safety today, that there might be civility and caring and love shown as your kingdom makes itself known in its midst. We pray for Pastor Keith as he prepares to come and lead and follow. We ask all these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. While we're doing this, uh, the offering will be collected.
And now we prepare for the bread of life and the cup of salvation that our Lord invites us to this day. Our Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, broke it and gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, Drink all of it. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All things have been prepared. Please come to the Lord's table, for it is now ready.
As you are able, please stand and receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. sure I get the words right because I always change them. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a great week everyone. Chorus. 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 Ready? One, two, three.